Alright, number one guys. So it says here that we need to solve 14n greater than 11n plus 6. So with these kind of questions, guys, always treat it like a normal equation, like one with an equal sign. So essentially, we just go make n the subject. Now to do that, we go move all the n terms to one side and the number terms on the right. Well, the n terms, we've got 14n and 11n. So to move 11n across, we go subtract 11n. So 14n minus 11n is 3n. And we keep 6 on the right. And then finally, just make n the subject by dividing by 3. So then you're left with n greater than 6 over 3, which is n greater than 2. That's it. Done. Now for part B, they say that we've got a number line below, which shows a set of values of x for which x plus 3 is between minus 2 and 4. Okay, so for this kind of problem, we just essentially got to isolate x, yeah? So we've got to make x in the middle, guys, yeah? And to do that, we just got to get rid of that plus 3. And to get rid of plus 3, you just got to subtract 3 on both sides, yeah? Simple as that. And the form will look something like that. It will be something here, less than x, less than equal, and something else. So subtracting 3 on both sides, you should get minus 5 over here, and you should get 1 over here. And then putting it together, it will look a bit like that. And now to plot this on a number line, all you got to do is literally just draw a straight line here from minus 5 to 1. And it looks like that. And now this is the part we've got to be careful here. Yeah? You've got a less than and a less than equal sign. So what this means is that you're going to draw two circles. The one that's equal to is shaded in. That means you include it. And the one you don't shade in, you don't include it. So it'll be just less than. So it just misses five, minus 5, but 1 is included. And that's it, guys. That's one number 1 done. On the grid below, draw the graph of y equals 2x minus 3, which is a straight line, for values of x from minus 2 to 4. So all this really means is that you're going to plug an x coordinate from minus 2, find a y coordinate, and then plot another point from 4, find a y coordinate, and then just hook them up together by drawing a straight line. So my tip, guys, just pick two random x values from here. I just picked endpoints. So I, I would actually just say when x is minus 2, then you just replace the x coordinate here with minus 2, you're going to get y equals uh, 2 times minus 2, take away 3. And because it's a calculator, you can just drop this all in, and you should get a minus 7. So, so this actually means that the first coordinate is going to be minus 2 and minus 7. Now, you pick another point, let's just say, I don't know, 4, yeah? So when x equals 4, you're going to get now y equals 2 times 4, so 2 times 4, take away 3. Once again, put in the same calculator, 2 times 4 is 8, 8 take away 3 is 5. So this indicates that the next coordinate is 4 and 5. And you're done, guys. You just plot this in, draw a straight line, and you're done. So we can say that minus 2 minus 7 is around here. You go across the x first, so minus 2 here, and then minus 7 down. So over here. And then for the next one, it's going to be, uh, what was it again? 4, 5. So it'll be 4 across, so 4 here, and 5. And yeah, and then drawing a straight line together, it should look a bit like that. And that's it, guys. You're done. So Hannah's planning a day trip for 195 students. She asked a sample of 30 students where they want to go. Okay, so out of 195, she's only taken a small sample of 30, yeah? Now, each student chooses a single place. The table shows information about her results. Okay, so we got four different places, and these were the number of students out of the 30 that went to certain places. Now, they're interested in working out how many of the 195 students you think will want to go to the theme park. Now, the way to do this, we kind of have to look at the values of what they've done. So, apparently, our 30 people, it looks like 10 of them went. So, it sounds to me like 10 out of 30, or one-third of the students, will probably go to theme park. So, if you had 195, we can assume that one-third of them, or 10 out of 30, of 195. And off just means times, by the way, guys. If you work this out, you should get 65. And that's it. And for the second bit, it tells us to state any assumptions you made and explain how this may affect your answer. Okay, so when they're talking about assumptions here, they're talking about how we got this data, yeah, and what are the steps to it. Well, since we just collected data, we know for sure that it just, well, it should have been random, because that's how you get something accurate. You have to always just pick random data, and the sample size matters, you know, the bigger, the more accurate. So I just said this, I said, all right, so the number of students chosen is just totally random. This makes it quite fair. And why is this important? Well, this makes the results fair and unbiased. So you're actually gonna get more accurate results. And if you're actually doing something for any surveys or stuff, this is kind of what we do. We always do fair results. And yeah, that's it for number three. So a container is in the shape of a cuboid 
and this container is two thirds full of water. All right, we're talking about this one up here. Now, a cup holds 275 milliliters of water. What is the greatest number of cups that can be completely filled with water from the container? Right. So this question is basically asking how many times can you fit this cup with this quantity into this container, which is two thirds full. Now, to realize to figure out what is the actual like volume of this container. We should just multiply these three values because that's the volume of a cuboid. And if you do so, you're going to have like a volume of 30 times 6 times 19. And doing that together in your calculator, you should get 3,420. Okay? Yeah. And this is literally the same as 3,420 milliliters because centimeter cube and milliliters are actually the same units. Yeah? They're actually equivalent. Now, at this stage, okay, that's how much volume we have. And it tells us that the container is actually two thirds full. So let's find two thirds of that quantity. Yeah? Two thirds of that should give us exactly 2,280 milliliters. So that's how much you can actually fill up here. Yeah? Now you just want 275 milliliters of that. So let's go ahead and divide that. Yeah? So we can say, all right, we can fill exactly 2,280 over 275 in, in your calculator, guys. And you're going to get like a decimal answer of this. Now it tells us in the question that what is the greatest number of cups that can be completely filled? Well, the greatest number of cups is going to be exactly eight because you're going to fill up eight cups. And you're still going to get some kind of like decimal in another cup. So you can say you can fill up exactly 8. And that's it. Okay, question 5. So ABC is a right angle triangle. Okay. Calculate the length of AB and give your answer credit to two decimal places. Alright, so this is just a straight up soccer top problem, guys. Yeah. And when you want to find out a certain length and there's nothing to it, let's just give it a name. So let's just call AB here X. Alright, keep it nice and simple. Now, because we're dealing with trigonometry, right angle triangles, always think so cat toa, yeah? And if you're not sure what each one is, so is basically the sine bit, cat is the cos bit, and t is the tan. Now, the o, h, and a represent opposites, so the opposite length. a is the adjacent, so the length next to the angle, and h is the hypotenuse. So to solve this problem, all you literally got to do is just label it nicely, yeah? So we ask ourselves, okay? What does the layer x and the value 17 represent here? Well, because the angle is 38, we say that opposite angle, the length of x is O, is opposite. And on the long diagonal side, this is always the hypotenuse. So we just write O and H. So that's it. Now, because we've got O and H, we just look at a soccer tour and we ask ourselves again, which one of these three terms have O and H? So O. Well, that's so. And so actually has that. Which I'm rewriting this one as a formula, it's literally going to be sine of the angle. So sine of the angle equals O, which is the opposite, over H, hypotenuse. So just like that. Now all we want to do is just fill this information up with our data above. So well, we can see that the angle here is 38, the opposite is X, and hypotenuse is 16. So it's going to look like this. Okay, so therefore it's that. And yeah, we're almost done guys. So just remember, we're trying to find the length of AB here, yeah? and we call it ABX. So we just got to rearrange and make x subject. Well, to find x, you just got to clear the fraction, yeah? So we've got times 16 across, so it look like that. And then just literally bust this in your calculator, and you're going to get an answer to 2dp equal to 9.85 centimeters. And we are done. All right, number six. So Sally used her calculator to work out the value of a number y. Now, the answer on the calculator display began like that. So if you had a calculator, it started like this, 8.3 and there's a bunch of numbers. Now, complete the error interval for y. So in this question, like you literally have to ask yourself, what could it have been, yeah? And the thing is of error interval, we're not looking at bounds. So immediately, this could confuse quite a lot of us. Sometimes we think we're looking for upper or lower bounds. But in reality, we're just thinking what the number could have been. I mean, it could have been something like 8.3125, 8.3967. Basically, we know that the smallest possible value could have been is 8.30001. So we could say the lowest value must have been 8.3. Now, the highest possible value could have been, I'm guessing, is like 8.3999999. So the error interval for this one is that it has to be less than, well, 8.4. Because anything less than 8.4 will give us 8.3 and whatever number they choose. And that's really all they want. All right, number seven. So 360 pound is shared between four people. Now the ratio of the amount that Abby gets to the amount that Ben gets, so the first two, is 2 to 7. So this means that for every two parts Abby gets, Ben's going to get 7 parts of it, so way more than Abby. Now Chloe and Dennis each get 1.5 times the amount Abby gets. 
So looking back, we know Abby gets two pars. That means 1.5 times 2 is actually 3 pars. So if we have to line this up in terms of Abby, Ben, Chloe, and Danish, we know that Abby gets two pars, Ben gets seven pars. And because Chloe and Danish each get 1.5 times each, 1.5 times 2 we said was three pars each. Okay, nice. So now they want us to work out the amount of money that Ben gets. So first things first, we need to first work out the total number of parts here. So if you add up all of these parts, we've got 2 plus 7 plus these two, we know that all together there's 15 parts involved. And we know that all these 15 parts must equal the total amount, which is £360. Now, to work out the amount Ben gets, we need to work out 7 parts. But before that, let's find one part, yeah? So one part means you're going to divide, uh, what's it called, 360 by 15. And if you do that, you should get £24 in your calculator. And lastly, to get seven parts, well, just times your answer by seven, and you end up with 168 pounds. And that's it. All right, number eight. So write this number in standard form. Okay, so to write any number in standard form, all you gotta do is always underline the non-zero values. So in this case, it's 562. Now, all you gotta do is just pull that number out and just rewrite as 5.62. So there's always a whole number and the rest as decimal. And then write times 10 to the power something. So this is your common standard form um, notation here. Yeah? And now to work out what the power is over here, all you've got to do is literally count how many zeros are before your first number 5. Yeah? So in this case, we've got 3. So in this case, it would be 10 to the negative 3. Okay? And that's it. This is standard form. For B, we need to now write this as an ordinary number. Well, most of the time, you could probably just drop this in your calculator and I think you should get the answer. Well, otherwise, because you've got power 3, all you've got to do is literally move this decimal place three places to the right. So it will end up becoming 1,452. And yeah, that's it. Number 9. The circumference of circle B is 90% of the circumference of circle A. Find the ratio of the areas of circle A to the area of circle B. Alright, so this is kind of a different one. Now, when you deal with circumferences and areas, we don't have to even think about circles here, guys. The whole point of this question is to, is to spot that this is actually a scale factor question. So it's also, all it's saying here is that when you're going from, let's say, uh, ratio of B over A, this means that you've got some kind of scale factor of 0 0.9 because of that. However, if you're dealing with areas instead of lengths, then the scale factor is squared, so then it'll be 0 0.9 squared, which is 0 0.81. Now, when it's saying find the ratio between the area of circle A to the circle B, we can more or less say that circle area circle B is going to be 9% squared or 0 0.81 of circle A. So in other words, the ratio is therefore going to be uh, 1 to 0 0.81. And I think it's always better simplify this, guys. And what I'll do is just, you know, just times by 100. And this is basically 100 to 81. So this is the kind of ratios we're looking for. Now for the next bit, it says square E has size of length E centimeters, cool. And square F has size of length F. So it's always good to kind of visualize this here. So you've got square E with lengths E, E, E. And you also got an F with lengths F, 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 and F. Now it tells us here that the area of square E is 44% greater than the area of square F. Okay, in other words, yeah, if we find the area of square E, so let's call this area of square E. Well, it's just going to be e times e, which is e squared, whereas area square f is just f squared. However, it tells us that the area square e is 44% greater than square f. So if I have to equate these two, we can basically say that area of square e is literally 1.44. Because remember, when you're increasing things, it's like 100% plus 44%, so 1.44. So it's kind of like a multiplier. So 1.44 of um, area f yeah so that's exactly what they're saying now work out the ratio of e to f so just like the previous question you see how we went from length to area we have to square it we're going from area to length because remember this is like areas of the uh, ratio of two lengths e to f so since that is if the scale factor is 1.44 the area scale factor that means the length scale factor is going to be the square root of 1.44 and this is going to be 1.2 and that's the answer, guys. The, the ratio of e to f is going to be um, 1.2 to 1. So in other words, 12 to 10, if you multiply it by 10. 
And if you simplify that shoe, like, why not? You get 6 to 5. So I think any of these answers are good. It says that Mary travels to work by train every single day. Now, the probability that her train will be late on any day is 0 0.15. So this is basically telling us that the probability that her train will be early on any day must be the other way around, 0 0.85. And remember, guys, all probabilities must always add up to 1. And, okay, that's all we're given. So we have to complete the property tree diagram for Thursday and Friday. Now, from the information, if late is 15%, that means being not late is 85% or 0 0.85. And, well, there's no other condition, so we're just going to assume that it's always the same. It's going to be 0 0.15 to be late, 0 0.15. And not late, 0 0.85, 0 0.85. So, nice and easy, guys. This is an easy two marks backed. Now, B, work out the probability that her train will be late on at least one of these two days. Okay, so this is kind of a clever question. When this is late on at least one of these two days, so this means that, for example, you could be late on Thursday and not be late on Friday, or you don't have to be late on Thursday and then be late on Friday. Or, because it says at least, meaning you can also be both. You could be late on both days. So, late, late, Thursday, Friday. So, this is essentially, that if we look at it this way, we're looking at the property of being late late so we can write in steps property of being late to late which is 0 0.15 times 0 0.15 or property of being not late than late or late and not late so it's going to be in other words property of late and not late and you're doing this twice here yeah? this is just going to essentially be two loss of 0 0.15 times 0 0.85 and then you just pretty much do the maths here, guys. You just work this out. So for the first one, 0 0.15 times 0 0.15, you should get uh, 0 0.0225. And for the next one, you should get actually, well, according to my calculator, um, 0 0.255. And then if you just add up both results, you should get an answer, well, a total probability of 0 0.2775. So this is essentially telling us, guys, that there is a chance of being, uh, what's that, roughly a 28% chance that she'll be late on at least one or two days. So that's, actually I'm not going to, that's kind of high. That's quite high still. And yeah, that's worth three marks. And now, number 11. So the group frequency table gives information about the times in minutes that 80 office workers take to get to work. Okay, 80. So that means the total frequency is 80 so far. Um... Complete the cumulative frequency table. Right, so just a quick recap, guys. Yeah, frequency just means like how many occurred in a certain interval. So, for example, according to this data, we can say that on the first part, five office workers took about zero to 20 minutes to get to work, whereas the majority of them, 30 of them, took between 20 and 40 minutes to get to work. So, they probably live kind of close. Cumulative frequency just means you just go add as you go along because you can kind of see that you know, there's what it's trying to say here that the first 20 minutes. Now, cumulative frequency table just pretty much tells us that we have to add along, yeah? We're just pretty much including or accumulating as we go along. Now, cumulative frequency table is more or less just telling us that we need to accumulate the frequency as we go along. So, for example, if the first row is 5, that means this part is going to be 5. Next part, you add 30 more, so it'll be 35, and so on. And you keep adding. Add 20 more is 55. Um, add 15, uh, it's going to be 70, add 8, 78, and add 2 is 80. And this is perfect because it's supposed to check out at 80 because that's how many, what is it, office workers were there. Alright, cool. That's only worth a mark, so yeah. And now on B, we need to draw a cumulative frequency graph for this information. Alright, and this is pretty much plotting the data we just did into this graph. Now, to do it nicely, all you guys have to do is just look at the time, just match up here. So, for example, we could say that for the first 20 minutes here, so the end points, there was a total of 5 um, office workers. So, we go under 20 minutes and go up to 5. So, it's about there. And the next one, for 40 minutes, it went up to 35. So, 40, shift up to 35, which is there. Um, next one, 60 went up to 55. And that's like there. So that's it guys, we just keep doing this. Next one, 80 goes up to 70. Um, 100 goes up to 78. So this is kind of close. You've got to be on that line. And lastly, 120 has to be here, right at the top. 
and as always for all these kind of cumulative frequency problems you always start at an initial point of zero zero so basically right bottom corner so this means at no minutes there should be nobody yeah and now to complete this all you do have to, all you have to do now is just connect the graph yeah so just do a freehand sketch so start from here and try and do smooth curve if possible oh i missed that already and just yeah it's kind of tricky but just try your best and it should end like here and if you wanted to you could carry on i guess but it's no biggie now for the last part for part c it says um use your graph to find an estimate for the percentage of these office workers who take more than 90 minutes to get to work more than 90 minutes so what this actually means guys is that all we have to do is find the 90 minute mark which is actually over here and just pretty much count how many people and then switch to a percentage so we can say at the 90 minute mark if we just like literally went all the way up we're looking to be around here so this is actually this cut off point here well, one of these cut off points so I'm just going to say for the sake of um, so I think my graph is a bit too high I think it should cut off around let's just say 74 yeah because I feel like it should be cut a, lot, a little bit early so, so we can say for those who take more than 90 minutes we're looking at this group yeah so this is the group above and that's pretty much including um, what was it the last six people yeah so 80 take with 74 is 6 and to change this to a percentage guys that's essentially 6 over 80 and you just multiply that by 100 and if you do that you should get about 7.5 percent and that's your answer guys so OAB is a sector of a circle with center O and radius 7 okay so you can kind of picture this guys as like pretty much part of a full circle yeah and they've cut it by some kind of fraction now best way I, can, I like to imagine this guys is that there, there's always some kind of angle here so let's call this angle X and this is kind of been divided by X out of 360 yeah so if you got a whole like circle out of 360 then it's going to be X out of it that's what it is now it tells us that the area of this sector is 40 centimeters squared so just let's note it down here and we want to calculate the perimeter sector so try and work out what P is okay now give your answer credit to three same figures so let's do something first things first yeah? let's go ahead and define what we know now it tells us that the area of a sector area of a sector generally is always a fraction of the circle in other words x over 360 times pi r squared so, and we know that the area is 40 so using the general formula we have something like that area equals x over 360 times pi r squared now putting everything we know we know the area is 40 and the radius is um, 7 looks a bit like that 7 squared is 49 so 49 pi now what we want to do here guys is pretty much find the value x because when you know the value x we can use it for something else so just times the 360 and dividing by 49 pi you can get x to look like that and then in your calculator you're going to get an angle of 93.544 degrees so my advice for these kind of values here when you put stuff in the calculator it's always good to round it up to like i don't know like a couple decimal places only because you know you might need it later on so now we're at that stage what's next we're trying to find the perimeter right so we've got seven we've got seven we need to work out this arc length here so let's call this arc length l yeah now we can say that the arc length is literally the same kind of formula it's a fraction of circle again x over 360 times the circumference 2 pi r it's going to look a bit like that l equals x over 360 times 2 pi r sorry if i put the bottom guys yeah couldn't find no space and now just replacing what we know we know what r is we know what x is it's going to look like that so put in your calculator you're going to get exactly 11.429 and we're done now so the perimeter is just going to be the sum of these three values 7 7 and l and then working that out you should get 25.4 to three cinnamon figures and that's it it says show that six plus all of this here and by the way square bracket is just another bracket it's just something so you don't mix up what bracket you're using so x plus 5 divided by this quadratic over this linear and we're going to show that all of these terms simplify to a linear over a linear term where we have to figure out a b c and d is now what i would personally do guys is is literally ignore the six plus for a second yeah let's just work inside the bracket and let's just try and apply the rules now the first thing we need to know is that because you've got a little division sign here division literally means um times but flip the other fraction upside down so we're going to have to flip this upside down so look a bit like that and we're going to have essentially six plus and just to make it kind of clear i also put this over one because we, so that way we can kind of see that the fractions line up this it's always so any term is always over one now all you want to do guys is probably just factorize the bottom up here yeah? so let's look at this quadratic for a second x squared plus 3x minus 10 
To factorize it, all you need is two numbers that multiply to make 10. So for example, let's say 2 and 5, yeah? When we do this, you can realize that with 2 and 5, you can make a plus 3 if you have a plus 5 and a minus 2, okay? So it's going to look like that, plus 5 and minus 2. Now all you want to do is literally use the times the rule, and if you're times in two fraction guys, you just hit head on. So it'd be x plus 5 times that, 1 times this. However, what we could do is something small. We could cancel down. We can cancel this and that. You can cancel terms. And then it reduces to simply x minus 1 over x minus 2. And we could just leave it open like that. Now, what you want to do here is pretty much combine the whole number of a fraction. And if you, if you remember, a whole number is always the same as like over 1. So 6 over 1. And to add fractions, you need to have a common denominator. So, so far, we've got x minus 2 here and we've got 1. So, in other words, we need to times the right side by 1, which is the same. And we times the left side by x minus 2 in the bracket here. So, it will look something like this. It will literally be 6 times x minus 2 plus x minus 1 all over x minus 2. Basically like that. Okay, nice and simple. And then all you want to do is just, um, what is it, expand the bracket. And then we have 6x minus 12. And just open this one up. And what, oh yeah, one little tip, you never need to really deal with the bomb. Always leave it factorized, yeah? And then collecting like terms, 6x plus x is 7x, minus 12 minus 1 is minus 13. And voila, guys, we're done. So we can just say straight off the bat that a is going to be 7, uh, b is going to be 13, c is going to be 1, because it's like 1x, and uh, d is going to be 2. And that's it. Question 14. So a car moves from rest... The graph gives information about the speed v meters per second of the car t seconds after it moves. Okay, so across the horizontal axis, guys, we've got time, and across the upwards, we've got speed. Yeah, and when they say the word rest, what they're trying to say is that from uh, initial speed of zero. So you start from right at the beginning. Yeah. Now for part A, they want us to calculate an estimate of the gradient of the graph at time equals 15. All right. So what this is essentially saying, guys, is that all you got to do is literally tick off this 15 here. And you just have to draw kind of a straight tangent line, yeah? So a line that hits exactly at 15 at one point. So it's kind of tricky to do, but you need a ruler that just places like that. So what I've done, like I've just tried a few times, and I've got something like this, okay? So this is an example of a tangent line. So it's always good to label it as well. So tangent. Now what this tells us here is that in order to find an estimate of the gradient, like just like in general y equals uh, mx plus c equations, to find a gradient, you just literally need um, to find the change in y over the change in x. So in this in this sense, it's the change in the y coordinates over the change in x. In our case, it's going to be the change in v because the y axis is v. So we just we just got to recognize these coordinates here. So at this point, you can see that the x coordinate is 15 and the y coordinate is actually well. What's it going up in? It's going up. So in every two blocks is one unit. So it'd be 16, 17, 18. So we can say that this coordinate here is going to be 15 and 18. Whereas we can pick another point. Let's just pick the one over here because it's easy to see. It's going to be 0 and 7.5. 7 so 0 and 7.5. And now to find the change in y over change in x, it's a change in coordinates. So we can say that the gradient being the change in v over change in t, subtracting two pairs, so 18 take away 7.5 and 15 take away 0, you're going to put this in the calculator and get 0.7. Now the good thing is this question is that even if you don't get this exact value, if you get anywhere between 0 0.6 to 1 as your gradient, you get the mark, as long as the method is kind of similar. Now for part 2, it says describe what your answer in part 1 actually means. Well, what's actually happening here is that you can see that as time goes on, the speed is going up. So we could just say nicely, increase in speed over time. Okay? Or you can say there's a kind of acceleration going on, because that's how you increase from speeds, is by accelerating. And that's all. Um, now for part B, it says work out an estimate for the distance the car travels in the first 20 seconds of its journey. Okay, so we're talking about from 0 to 20 up to here, yeah? And use four strips of equal width. Okay, so typically for distance, for to work out distance, it's literally the area under the curve, or area under the shape. Now because it's a curve, it's kind of hard to see what shape it would be. But because it wants to draw four strips of equal width, it means that from 0 to 20, you need four lines. And well... You can see that 20 divided by 4 is 5. So you can do strips at every 5 points. So like 1 here, 1 there, 1 here, and even 1 there. Now looking at this carefully, to work out the area of each shape, we can kind of like estimate it. That's what they want. So you can kind of think of 0 to 5 as some sort of like triangle. And from 5 to 10 as a trapezium, another trapezium, and another trapezium. Okay? 
Now, well, to work at the area of triangle is, is quite okay. It's literally base times height and then you half it. So you can see that the base for all of these is 5, which is good. So it'll be 5 times the height. In this case, the height should be 4, by the way. So every two blocks is 4. So 5 times 4 is 20. Divide by 2 gives you 10. Now, to work out this one for trapezium, the area of trapezium is a bit different. What you first have to do is find the average of two heights. So let's have a look. The first height here is 4, and the second height goes up to, what's that, 12. So it'll be 4 plus 12, and then you find average. 4 plus 12 over 2, and then you times against is with 5. So 4 plus 12 over 2 times 5 will give us a result of 40. And then repeat the same here. The good thing is, like, you're always going to start with the next number. So because you know this was 12, this will be 12 again. The height here will now be 18, like we found earlier. So it'll be 12 plus 18 over 2 times 5. Put this in your calculator and you get 75. And then repeat for the third case. You're going to have 18 and 20 this time. And 18 plus 20 over 2 times 5 will give us 95. And that's it, guys. And now to work out the distance, it's literally just adding up the areas, yeah? So we can say distance equals 10 plus 40 plus 75 plus 95. Again, in your calculator, you should get a nice answer of 220. So the total distance is 220 meters. So make M the subject of this formula. Okay, so this one's pretty cool. Now, to make M the subject, guys, first thing you always want to do every time you have an algebraic fraction is to always clear that fraction, yeah? So you just want to get rid of M minus 1. Well, to do that, to clear fraction, you just got to multiply by itself. So what I'll do is I'll times M minus 1 across, so that goes and it sticks on F, a bit like that. And then from here, guys, all you want to do is expand the bracket, yeah? Expanding this, F times M is FM, and F times 1 is F, so you get something like that. And copy the rest now from here the best thing to do is to in order to make m the subject you should try and move all the m terms on the same side yeah so so far it looks to me like we've got an fm over here and we've got three m over here so we want to basically shift this across here and once we got all the m terms on one side is good and then we just get rid of the non f terms across so here we got the minus f and that can go on this side and to move it across we're going to have to add f to move three m across we're going to minus three m yeah, so when you move everything across, you end up something like this, yeah? So you've got FM minus 3M now, and then 4 plus F. So you just did the changes. We just swapped the positions around. Okay, so this step is actually um, quite tricky because you either know or you don't know what to do. Now, if you know what to do, you realize that because they both got M's here, you could factorize M out. And that's it. If you factorize a common term out, you're going to get F minus 3 in a bracket, just like that. And then finally, guys, to make M the subject, just throw F minus 3 across. If you divide it, you're just going to get 4 plus f over f minus 3. And that's it. So the straight line L has the equation 3y equals 4x plus 7. All right. The point A has this corner, 3 and minus 5. Okay, so before I read the rest of this, every time you're given a straight line in any equation, yeah, so typically these types here, yeah, always rewrite this into this form, into the y equals mx plus c. Yeah? In this case, where m is your gradient and c is your y-intercept. Okay. Basically, when you do this, it will make the layer questions easier. So if I had to do this right now, yeah, what, to rearrange this into that form, you can just see that to get y equals, you've got to divide it by 3. So if I to divide the whole thing by 3, you're going to get 4 over 3 and 7 over 3. So it'll look a bit like that. y equals 4 thirds x plus 7 thirds. And instantly, you can see the m value is 4 thirds. And that's what we care about. Now, the next part says, find an equation of the straight line that is perpendicular to the line that we're interested in, so this line, so perpendicular to that, and pass it through that point A with that coordinate. Right, now to find this perpendicular line, what you guys need to know is that you need a perpendicular gradient, okay? To get the perpendicular gradient, you just use the previous gradient, flip it upside down, and change the sign. So it looks like that, m equals minus 4, minus 3 over 4. And this is known as the negative reciprocal, okay? You always do that. If they told you to find a straight line that is parallel, then you actually have to use the same gradient. So that instead, the gradient will still be 4 thirds. But perpendicular means upside down, change the sign. Okay, so now you've got this new gradient. You can substitute this one into your current formula. So y equals mx plus c. Replaces m with that value and keep this c as it is. You're going to get this. Okay? What this tells us now is that we just have to find what c is and then we've done the question. Okay, so to find the coordinates, to find the, the, the y-intercept, um, you can use the information they give you, which is passes through a. What this means is that if you replace x and y here with 3 and minus 5, you're going to get like this. You end up getting minus 5 equals and then minus 3 over 4 times 3, which is minus 9 over 4 plus c. And to get c, just rearrange it, guys, yeah? Just add 9 over 4 across. 
So you're going to have minus 5 plus 9 over 4, and you're going to get a C value of minus 11 over 4. By the way, guys, because it's a calculator, test, always use your calculator. Don't, like, literally, don't bother working out in your head. It's not necessary. Now that you've got the C value, you just substitute this back into your original equation here, and then you realize that your new value, your final equation is going to be y equals minus 3 over 4x minus 11 over 4, and you're done. So there are small cubes and large cubes in a bag. The cubes are either red or yellow, okay? Now the ratio of the number of small cubes to the large cubes, so let's just underline them both, is 4 to 7, okay? So altogether there's 11 parts. Now the ratio of the number of red cubes to the yellow cubes, again, underline them both, is 3 to 5. So that means there's 8 parts altogether. So it's always good to just tore up the parts because we might need it later. Now, explain why the least possible number of cubes in the bag is 88. Well, just have a look at this for a second. The only way you can match up the number of uh, small and large with the color cubes is if they had the same um, LCM. In this case, if you add them up, you make 11. Add them up, you make 8. The only way they're the same is if you multiply the first set by 8 and the bottom set by 11. And that's really it. That's all they really need to know. So you could say something like this. You could say that the total number of parts in the first and second ratios are these two. Therefore, the LCM of both these numbers are 88, which is the least number of cubes. And that's, that's all you have to do. Now, following that up, it says all the small cubes are yellow. Okay, so at this stage, it's important that we multiply, firstly, uh, all these values by 8 and all these values by 11. Now, work out the least possible number of large yellow cubes in the bag. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's just have a look at the 88 cubes, yeah? So, multiplying both these parts by 8, so 4 times 8 and 7 times 8 gives us 32 small cubes and 28 large cubes. And if you multiply the next part by 11, well, that's quite easy, you get 33 red cubes and 55 yellow cubes. Now, it just told us that all the small cubes are yellow, so all of these are yellow. So, that means 55 take away 32 will give us 23. And, of course, that's exactly how many are large yellow, because that's just the remainder. So, the answer would be 23. All right, number 18. So the points A, B, C, and D lie on the circle, and C, D is a straight line. Okay, so here's C, D. Now, according to the information, it tells us that B, A equals B, D. So we're talking about this shape here. So just immediately looking, guys, we can see that this first triangle is isosceles. And we can see that the second triangle, which is C, B equals C, D, so here equals that, uh, is also isosceles. So that means two pairs are the same. Now, they want us to work out the size angle AD. So, we're talking about from A to D to E. So, let's just call this angle here X, yeah? All of that. You must give a reason for each stage you're working. Okay, so before we go ahead and even try and attempt to solve this, let's go ahead and label every single angle. So, that way we won't make a mistake, yeah? So, for example, at capital A, I'm just going to call this one little A. At capital D, I'm going to call it little D. C, I call it C. B, I call it B. Now, for the rest of them, well, the last one, I'm going to call this one Y. Yeah, and I think that should be okay. Now, going through what we know, let's start with the middle triangle, yeah? Because we know it's isosceles, we can just say here that angles A and D are part of an isosceles triangle, meaning those two are the same. So, we can say that A equals D. So, we can say that 40 plus A plus D equals 180 degrees. Subtracting 40, we've got A plus D equals 140. And, well, because they're both the same, if we half it, we're going to get 70 each. So, that means... A equals 70 and D equals 70. So that's good so far. Now for the next triangle, we've got, uh, what is it, B, C, D, right? And before we even do that, let's go back to the property of this shape, yeah? So just look at the shape for a second. We basically have a four-sided shape here. So we have a quadrilateral inside the circle. Now this is known as a cyclic quadrilateral, guys, yeah? And the cyclic quadrilateral tells us that angles on the opposite end, so for example, A plus C, must equal to 180 degrees. So just using that information for a second, we can say that A plus C is 180. Since we know that A is 70, 180 take away 70 is going to give us a C value of 110. So that's good as well. Now, once again, looking at the same triangle, because we know it's isosceles, we can do the same method. Yeah? We can say that what? Um, angles B and Y are part of an isosceles triangle. So on the left-hand side, we can say that, well, uh, 110 plus B plus Y equals 180. Subtracting 110, you got B plus Y equals uh, 70 degrees. And well, since we know that they're both the same value, if you half this value 70, you're going to get 35 each. Now, we're basically done, guys, yeah? Remember, we're trying to find um, the size angle AD, so we're trying to find X. And now, just looking at the final part, what we have here is that we have a straight line, yeah? So, angles Y 
plus D plus X are part of a straight line. And we should know that all angles in a straight line add up to 180. So we can say that angles Y plus D plus X is 180. Well, we know what D and X are, or we know what D and Y are. 70 plus 35, that's 105. So if you subtract that from 180, you're going to get 75 degrees. And that's it. All right, number 19. So the diagram shows a triangular prism. Okay. The base ABCD of the prism is a square of side length 15. So on the ground, you've got 15 by 15, and it's 15 all the way across. Now, angle ABE and CB are right angles. Okay, so it's kind of useful information. So everything is practically a right angle. So one more tip to note is that everything on the base is also a right angle. For example, between A and D, so this part is right angled, this is right angled, and so on. Now, angle EAB is 35 degrees, and this is the, this is the killer one. So M is the point on DA such that between D to M and M to A is split into two and three parts. So we're talking about this line over here, guys, yeah? This line over here. Now, calculate the size of the angle between E to M. So E is striking out M. So M would be somewhere around there. So let's pretend it's around here. And the base of the prism. Give your answer credit to one decimal place. Okay, so before we start this, let's go ahead and try and just imagine this point M over here and just draw a line going down and then shoot into B, okay? So when you do an angle between the, the point and the base, it's always good to return it back to where it belongs, yeah? So if you start from the top, always go back to where it was vertically below, yeah? That's usually how we do these questions. Now, first thing you want to do as well, or the second thing you want to do, is to basically work out what is this position of M, so how far is it from D and A? Well, if you think about, 2 to 3 makes a total of 5 parts, right? So 5 parts represents the whole 15 centimeters. So dividing this by 5, we get one part which is three centimeters. And well, we're interested in two and three parts. So essentially, times it by three, you get nine centimeters. So this length is nine, and this length is six. So just drawing it nicely, and a purple line worth six. Okay, so I'm just gonna cross out this 15 as well. So we don't need this anymore. And this is now the point M. Okay? And oh yeah, because we wanna find the angle between them, we're gonna call this angle X as well, yeah? Just give everything a name. So what's next? Now we've done all of this one, let's go ahead and try and evaluate some triangles. So the first thing we want to do guys is to pretty much work out anything we have. So let's work with this triangle here because this is already the most filled out. We've got 35 degrees and 15, so I'm going to redraw A, E, B over here. So we've got A, E, B. So what we have here now, we've got 15 and we've got 35. We're interested in this length here because if you work out this um, length here, you can somehow relate it to this uh, darker triangle. So let's work out E, B. Now to work out, we need to use something known as Sokotoa again. So once again, this is trigonometry. So we're going back to 2D. And we ask ourselves, okay, what lengths are we interested in? So first things first, this is your angle 35. And opposite 35 is the opposite. And we have the adjacent, okay? So we need something that has O and A. And well, the only one that has it is Toa. So we rewrite this as tan of the angles, tan 35 equals opposite over adjacent. So EB over 15. And then just times in 15 across, guys. And in your calculator, just literally write 15 times tan 35 you should get approximately 10.5. Okay, so updating over here, you got 10.5. Okay, perfect. Now that triangle is done. How about we work with the triangle on the base, yeah? So just look at this one over here, the one on the ground. If you guys remember, on the ground, it's always right angled everywhere, yeah? So this is a right angle triangle. So we need a triangle that has between, from point M, A, and B. So I'll redraw it here. So you got M, um, A, and B. So you got 9 and 15. And we're interested in a line that links to the black triangle, which is M to B. So that's what we want. So to work out this one, now we need to use Pythagoras' theorem. And Pythagoras tells us that we have an A squared plus a B squared equals a C squared. So 9 squared plus 15 squared equals um, MB squared. And I forgot to put that there. Yeah. Now to work this out, literally just bust this in your calculator. And then when you square root it, just leave it in that form. So we can say that MB is basically root 306. Okay. Going across. Now, we're basically done, guys, yeah? So now, now, let's pull out our final right angle triangle from M to E to B, yeah? So I'm going to pull it right here. And we can see that we've got a length of MB, which is root 306. And we also have a length of EB, which is 10.5. Okay, so now, once again, using Sokoto, and this is triangle is exactly the same as the one above, we can use Toa. So it would be tan X equals opposite over adjacent. So exactly like you see. So tan X equals 10.5 over root 306. And then to find x, you have to use a tan inverse in your calculus. So in other words, you're going to use the tan negative 1, right? That's going to give us the solution of x. So in our calculator, x is going to equal tan inverse of this. 
and we should get a result of 31.0 and that's it guys now final question guys so CDEF is a quadrilateral okay so here we're looking at vectors now what I personally recommend that every time we do vectors is that we should always try and fill out the vectors with every single information we got before we even attempt the question and then try to attempt to fill out more parts so what do we have now it says going from C to D it travels by vector of A so we, all we do guys is just put an arrow here and write A and now go from D to E is a vector of little b so D all the way to D is little b but we should realize that M is actually a midpoint because it says here M is a midpoint so if the whole thing is B or 1B you can think of both these journeys as being half B's okay because the good thing about vectors is that as long as you go in the same direction it will just be scaled against itself so in this case it's scaled against B now going from F to C you're traveling A minus B so that's the vector left A minus B cool so so far so good now part A express F to E so going from vector F to E in terms of A and B now another another nice property of the vector is that to go from one place to another you can take any possible route as long as you get there so let's go all the way around yeah so if you sum up all of these so A minus B plus A plus half B plus half B you're actually just left with 2A so the vector is just 2A and that's it alright so part A wasn't so bad now let's go on to the final part guys yeah so M is the midpoint of DE now and X is the point on FM such that FX to XM is given by 2 to 1 alright so what this means guys if X to M was one part longer yeah, so you can just imagine it's one part that means F to M must be by M parts long so it's kind of like a lot of parts basically we don't know how many parts exactly but it's that many times being on one so essentially in total we know all together there's, a, there's actually a total of N plus 1 parts okay and I think this is very important to note we should definitely note this down so as a fraction we can say that this length fx could be understood as n over n plus 1 of the whole fm line yep we'll come to that in, in a second now the next part is that cxc is a straight line so it's good to just visualize that so here's our straight line now work out the value of n all right so that's that's the whole point to work out that part now to work this out there's actually a very quick and easy way the trick is that we just need to form two vectors right two kind of equations that have that involve n and another another random vector like probably like something from S, uh, CE so for example guys let's try and find something yeah so the first thing I'm going to try and find is probably just deal with the, the F line right so let's try and find an expression for FM so a way to find FM guys is that you can start from F and go all the way around to M kind of like how we did FE so it'd be A minus B plus A plus half B and you get something like that you tidy up minus b and plus half b would give you minus half b so this is the sum of these three vectors now if you want to find fx again we can use the idea that fx is a fraction of fm okay so we can say fx is in fact this fraction which is the part n over the total number of parts which is n plus one of your fm vector and this is actually one equation we can use so let's just keep this in mind yeah we don't need to substitute fm in right now now the next part here is a tricky one we now need to form another vector line so let's look at C for instance because they literally introduced that equation right so let's try and find an expression for C E now now to get from C to E it's quite straightforward you just travel A across and B down so it's just A plus B and what we can do from here is introduce a, a scalar suppose you want to go from C to X now because remember we're trying to get to X and we're going to somehow form an equation of X soon we can say that C to X is let's say it's probably like scaled by some kind of K factor right so we can say that it's, it's, it's one k of the whole thing. So k is less than one. We can say that cx is k times ce. Okay. So k is going to be less than one. It's just like a fraction of another thing. You can ignore this variable. It's just a little dummy variable we're going to use. So at this point now, now we got cx. How about we try and link cx to fx? Yeah. We, so what we could say, all right. How about we say fx equals um, fc plus cx? We know what fc is because we actually worked out before. It's a minus b. We know what CX is, it's K times C. So putting them together, you just get something like that. You just should get A minus B plus A times your C, which was A plus B. So that's your CX expression, that's your FC. Now, this is where it actually happens now. Now that you've got two FX expressions, what it's telling us that these two expressions, the one from above and one from below, are identical, right? So these are two identical expressions. And at this stage, guys, we can now equate them. So we basically have a minus b plus k times a plus b so the, the 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 vector we just obtained now equaling the very first 
uh, fx expression. So that's two. So this is how we're going to solve it now. Okay, so let's just turn the page. Okay, so what we're going to do now, guys, we're going to try and match coefficients of a and b. What this means is that we're just going to look at the, we're just going to try and make equations in terms of a and in terms of b. So we're going to get simultaneous pairs. So let's look at for a for a second, right? On the left hand side, we've got a plus ka, right? And on the right hand side, we've got n over n plus 1 times 2a. So these are the two a terms. We can ignore a for a second, right? So let's just cancel a out, divide a across. You're just going to have 1 plus k equals 2 times n over n plus 1. For b, again, similar idea, you've got minus b plus k times b. And on the right side, you've got n over n plus 1 times minus half b. Putting that all together, it looks like that. Cancelling um, b out, you're going to get something similar. Minus 1 plus k equals, um, instead of minus half, I'm going to keep it decimal. Minus 0 0.5 n over n plus 1. Okay, now you can kind of see, like hopefully at this stage, we can kind of see that we're dealing with simultaneous equations now. We're going to forget about k, yeah? Because we just want to find what n is. So the best thing to find n is to firstly make k the subject for both of these equations, yeah? So for the first equation, we're going to subtract 1, the second one, we're going to add 1, and we're going to get two equations like that. First one, the same one, minus 1. The second one is the same equation, but plus 1. Now we're going to combine these two, because with simultaneous equations, if they both equal k, that means they both equal each other. So like that. And now we're at the end, guys, yeah? So now we just got to solve this and we're done. So what I would do is I would not actually expand this, yeah? I'll go ahead and click like terms, right? You can kind of think of this whole n over n plus 1 as a single term, yeah? Like just one big x. So what we're going to do, we're going to move all the n terms to the left, that, or, or this massive x term. So we're going to basically add, move z minus 0 0.5 of this term across by adding it. So it'll be 2.5 lots of it. And we're going to add this minus 1 across. So it'll look a bit like that. So now you've got 2.5 lots of n over n plus 1s. And finally, guys, divide 2.5 across, so you get 4 fifths. Now, we don't even have to solve this because why? Since they're both n terms, we can just use inspection, just look at it and just say, all right, n must be 4, because that's what it said. And n plus 1 must be 5, because it makes sense. You've got 4 over 4 plus 1, which is 4 fifths. And that's it, guys. I think we did it. And this gives us a total n value of 4. And we are done.